she oh, told me to say hi to her, oh, her people. Yeah. And she was, yeah. yeah. And so do you work in the library? I'm with UO Online. So we, we, we rent space in the library, yeah. and I get to benefit from things like fruit sauces she makes for breakfast parties and that sort of thing. That's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, you have to come and say hi. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and Elizabeth also. Yeah, yeah. I, got, I got a chance okay. to introduce myself. Okay. Yeah. It's nice to meet you. Bro. It's nice to meet you, too. I, I was just telling Elizabeth I used to work in disability services, okay. so I'm really excited by your presentation. Oh, great. Yeah, that was a big motivation to move toward faculty services mm -hmm. to actually <clears> like, help design from the ground up rather than mm -hmm. retrofit solutions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It seemed like in accessibility is a lot easier for you to do it from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. When you know what you're doing yeah. in the first place yeah. instead yeah. of trying to make changes halfway through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm just yeah. looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for coming to our session. My name is Elizabeth McBrien. I'm an instructional designer with Oregon State University eCampus, and I use she, her pronouns. Hi, everyone. I'm Heather Garcia. I'm also an instructional designer with Oregon State eCampus. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And just as a little side note, I found out recently that today is Share Your Pronouns Day. Um, so, <laughs> so I'd encourage you, if you feel comfortable, sharing your pronouns um, with your colleagues at the conference. Yeah, or you can get a pad and write about your name. Pad. Yes. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, so we'd like to start today just by acknowledging that this beautiful town that we're in, of Bend, Oregon, um, is actually the original homelands of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. The Confederated Tribes ceded this land in the Treaty of 1855 while retaining regular and customary hunting, fishing, and gathering rights. The Northern Paiute, <coughs> the Wasco, and the Warm Springs people inhabited this area seasonally and clearly established their presence here. We would just like to acknowledge and thank the original stewards of this land. Um, so as we mentioned, we're here from Oregon State eCampus. Um, there are many units within eCampus, and we are from the Course Development and Training Unit. Um, eCampus has over 20 undergraduate degrees online <coughs> and over 25 graduate degrees online. We work with um, over 1,200 courses and have over 800 faculty partners, so we're a fairly large unit. Okay, I'd like to go over the outcomes for today's session. <clears throat> um, we'll differentiate between accessible design, universal design, and inclusive design, and reframe disability based on these principles. Um, we'll describe the current demographics of online students, identify their diverse needs, and explore assumptions, list benefits to learners when principles of inclusive design are used to design courses, and list practical steps faculty and designers can take to make courses more welcoming and inclusive. So for our agenda, we'll start with an overview and some background. Um, we'll look at some data about students, too, and do some activities and wrap up. So to get started, um, just by a show of hands, who here um, has an idea of what it really means to have an accessible online course? Maybe we want to a little bit. So okay. Hear the word. Great, great. And I think you had your hand up. Mm -hmm. um, could you, would you like to share some attributes of accessible online courses? Or would anybody like to maybe share some, uh, some attributes of what does an accessible online course include? Mm -hmm. Kevin, you'll have a mm -hmm. text or readable component for mm -hmm. those who are auditorily challenged for this yeah. course. Yeah. We can keep up with the PC thing, sorry. But, yeah. um, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so, okay. There are options to address any of, any of the disabilities mm -hmm. trying to access yeah. that course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you bring up a good point. Um, accessibility is really intended to address disability specifically. So some examples would be using alt text for your images, which would allow a screen reader to read, um, to communicate what the um, importance of that image might be to someone who can't see it. Another example is using headings and lists to add structure to your pages so that those pages can be navigated by, um, by a screen reader. And, and that structure can be communicated to someone who can't see it. Another common example would be caches and transcripts. So 
so that's useful to someone who, um, who can't hear or has difficulty hearing. Um, other examples include um, um, someone with mobility um, challenges may need to use a keyboard for navigation, for example. Um, so the idea with it, accessibility then is that it's intended to address usability um, issues specifically for individuals who have certain uh, disabilities. It's also a legal compliance issue, so it's something that we have to comply with by law, and it is an outcome. So the end goal is to have an accessible product when we're done creating the, the content. Okay, so let's then <coughs> um, take a moment to address disability. So if accessibility is intended to increase access for users with disabilities, um, disability is then, um, originally it was a personal health condition. So according to the World Health Organization, disability was defined as a health condition. Whereas after 2001, the World Health Organization defined disability as a mismatched interaction between a person and their environment. So prior to 2001 then, the issue was with the individual. Right? It was something that they were um, struggling with. Whereas after 2001, um, the issue was then with the environment. And so the environment is something that we as educators and as designers can control. We have some control over the environment. So this places the onus not on the individual, or not just on the individual, but also on the people that have control over the environment that that individual is interacting with. So the environment is something that we can change and accessibility really defines how we make those changes or what those changes should be. <clears throat> so while accessibility addresses specific features of a learning environment, universal design for learning takes a broader approach. Um, so the end goal is still to have a course that is accessible, but also to have, um, it takes us in approach in more of a broad, holistic way. So the goal of universal design then is to provide the greatest degree of access and usability for all individuals, not just individuals who, are, who have a, a disability. Universal design for learning is a framework and it has three general principles and we won't go to, into these into too much detail, uh, but just to give you an idea, the first guiding principle is multiple means of engagement. So this really appeals to the effective domain, um, to getting learners interested in the content, um, and to keeping them engaged in the learning material. So you can use the A, but not use number one. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So this takes, um, to have a universal design, you need to be accessible, but this kind of goes beyond that, right? Um, Another guiding principle is multiple means of representation. Um, so this involves presenting information in different ways. So um, this might include having your learning material in video and, or also in, um, in text. And the third guiding principle is multiple means of action and expression. Um, this means giving students choice for how they represent their knowledge or demonstrate their learning. So let's... Um, it's important to note that universal design actually emerged from universal design, universal design for learning emerged from universal design, which is actually an architectural concept. So they both have the same goal, which is to provide the greatest degree of access and usability for the um, widest range of individuals. But to illustrate, I just wanted to look at a brief example from universal design. Um, so here on this slide, we have a revolving door. Traditionally, to open a door, one would have to turn the knob and push it open. Um, for someone who's mobility challenged, this may be difficult. So a revolving door enables um, folks with certain barriers to be able to get through the door, but also um, individuals perhaps that maybe have a situational um, issue. They have their luggage. arms full of luggage. <laughs> yes, we're all um, probably familiar with that. Um, or groceries, or maybe they're carrying a child. So um, the revolving door removes barriers and it, benef it benefits anyone who's experiencing a barrier, not just someone who has a disability. Okay, so then we have inclusive design. And it's really easy to conflate universal design for learning and inclusive design. I know I've used those terms interchangeably in the past many times. Um, but one distinction to keep in mind and to kind of remember how they, they differ is that universal design for, for learning emerged from architecture, whereas inclusive design uh, was born out of digital environments. It really emerged um, on the web. So while architecture is fixed, the web is flexible and ever-changing. Um, 
And so as a result, an inclusive design approach is more process driven. Um, it emphasizes flexibility and really features um, concepts such as co-creation. Um, co-creation allows for multiple viewpoints to influence the design. Um, frequent feedback is an inclusive practice. practice. Um, and this could be involving um, end users early on in the process and specifically seeking out contributions from excluded communities. Inclusive design is iterative, so it's not as much focused on the end product as accessibility and universal design are, but really about the process. So in this way, um, Elizabeth and I created this graph to hopefully illustrate that accessibility and universal design are part of inclusive design. Um, the end goal is always to have a product that is accessible and universally designed. Um, but inclusive design really kind of guides how we get there and helps us to think about the bigger picture and also just reminds us that this is an iterative process and it's never really done. We kind of need to um, keep revisiting and keep working. So just to um, give you an idea of some um, general practices, just to kind of help illustrate what inclusive design, what an inclusive design approach might look like. Um, we wanted to give some examples here. So one example of an inclusive design process is to build rapport um, with students. So in an online course, this might look like um, just infusing your instructor presence through videos or through being responsive in the Q&A forum with students. Another inclusive design practice is um, asking for feedback. As I mentioned earlier, um, early frequent feedback is an inclusive practice. And in an online course, this might look like uh, serving students and getting feedback on the design and, and kind of maybe modifying from there. Um, another inclusive process is clear, having clear criteria and structure. This might look like having rubrics or templates in your course. Uh, there's some recent research on um, structure specifically as an inclusive practice. And some of that research is showing that structure disproportionately benefits marginalized groups. So students that come from a marginalized group um, everyone benefits from structure, but those who are marginalized may see even increased benefits. Another example is to feature um, examples from people in your field that may not look like what the students would expect. So in STEM fields and a lot of science courses, this might look like featuring work or readings from, um, from female scientists, for example. Um, promoting student agency and autonomy by giving them choice is another inclusive practice. This allows students to um, kind of choose how they demonstrate their knowledge. And then finally, we have um, real world, emphasizing real world applic applications of the coursework so students can see how um, the content applies directly to their daily lives. Okay, <clears throat> earlier Heather mentioned um, accessibility and disability and how the World Health Organization um, defines disability as a mismatch between the person and the environment. So I wanted to show this illustration about mismatches, and it illustrates how ability um, is kind of a spectrum, and it really changes throughout our lives. So we might have certain abilities when we're young that we don't have when we get older, and these things can be permanent, or they can be temporary or situational. So for example, um, if you look here about sight, you have a permanent situation, a temporary um, situation, and a situational mismatch. So someone who is blind, it, that could be a permanent condition, but it might not have started you know, at the beginning of life. Um, then you have a temporary situation, which is perhaps cataracts, and then a situational um, distracted driver who cannot see. So we kind of move in and out of these mismatches throughout our lives. <clears throat> So here's a quote I want you to think about. Um, there is no such thing as a typical student. And um, what do you think about this statement? And what might be the benefits of designing for extremes? And when I mean extremes, I mean things that we may not think of a typical student as having, like perhaps they cannot see or they have hearing loss, that kind of thing. Um, so let me give you a quick example before you turn to a partner and discuss this. Um, so for example, let's say we have a student who can see, who can hear, 
is financially stable, maybe works part-time. How does designing for that typical student make any innovative design decisions compared to maybe designing for a student who has a particular disability or situation that they're facing? So um, I'd like you to turn to a partner and talk about this quote and kind of discuss these questions for just a few minutes.
I just wanted to get a graduate, another graduate degree. And I, I talked to the school thinking they would not modify my program. But it was totally irrelevant. And um, yeah, so that was an example of where I was sort of on that edge. Mm -hmm. And this, the structure was so put in place that you know I had to just eat it. Yeah, that's a great example of you know maybe feeling like you belong or not, you know, based on what was designed in place. Anyone else? Okay, so yeah, so thinking about this then, if there if there is no typical student, well, who are our students and how do we get to know them and um, how do we find things, how do we find out about them? <clears throat> so I'd like to just go through a little bit of um, d data about students these days and um, start by some information from the National Center for Education Statistics, a 2015 report. So this is already a few years old, but we can see that 74% are, quote, non-traditional. So what does that mean exactly, <laughs> non-traditional? Well, um, it means having one or more of the following characteristics. <clears throat> so financially independent from their parents, which is about half now of college students. Um, Having a child or other dependent, which is about one in four caring for a child, um, being a single caregiver or lacking a traditional high school diploma, uh, delaying post-secondary enrollment, about a quarter take a year off before starting school, attending school part-time, so about 47% do, do that at some point, and being employed full-time. So 74% of college students are checking one of these boxes and many have two or three of these characteristics. <clears throat> so that makes a traditional student, by definition, a single person <laughs> who's relying on family money, mm -hmm. who cares for nobody else but themselves, uh -huh. and what was the other point? Uh, yeah, about That's caregivers and... Work. Had, work. So right. work full -time or students. works part-time. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right. Who didn't delay enrollment. Yeah. 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 Who went to high school, yeah. not a GED. So, success, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so, so now let's, that was about all college students, okay? So let's shift now to online students in particular. So here's some information from um, a 2019 comprehensive data on demands and preferences um, from Wiley, and it shows that um, for undergraduates, most are female students, um, about 38% are married or partnered, 37% um, have at least one child, 43% have an annual household income of less than 40,000, about half work full time, and about 29% are first in their family to go to college. And um, this is for all online students, so undergraduates and graduates, and you can see that these figures are really similar. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot have family obligations, for example, and then you'll notice that 64% um, have an annual household income above 40,000. So working professionals probably in their household and um, you know, not necessarily 18, 19 year olds, right? Okay, um, so this, I thought this was a really interesting fact that 93% of online students join a program to fulfill career aspirations. So um, economics is really driving a lot of, yeah. I run a little counter to the 
four percent above forty thousand. Well, three percent more yeah. ice can go in for a career aspiration. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be an awful lot of those who are already making money. Yeah, well, a household. So forty thousand for a household. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's there's so much. I mean, there's so much here. <laughs> I, I agree that it raises so many questions. Yes, I, I completely agree. Um, and so, yeah, economics is really driving students to study online. For OSU in particular, where we work, um, a lot of students are stopouts, so they might have started earlier. Yes, question. Do you, I was just going to. Do you know on the source data, is, it, is that fully online or does mm -hmm. that take any online file? It's fully online, fully yes. Okay. yes, as far as I remember, I believe. And so um, a lot of OSU students are working adults. Um, they may not be able to leave their job, for example, to move to Corvallis where the university is um, and that kind of thing. So um, as far as driving that decision to study online, um, for most people, it just works best for their current you know, work and life situation. Um, for only just over a third, it's their preferred way of learning. And um, just for a very small amount, I could only find my study area of interest online. So there were no other options. So, um, OK, so another interesting area to consider here for the kinds of um, things that students are coming to college with or going to online courses with is um, their basic needs. So this is from a college and university basic needs and security report. And um, it showed that, I believe this was 2018, but I didn't put the year. But um, so 45% of respondents were food insecure in the prior 30 days. <clears throat> and so that can be, um, that's kind of a shocking figure. And there's been a lot of controversy around this report in particular. but. Um, also, Sarah Goldrick Robb, who was one of the authors of this report, said, well, even if it isn't exactly 45%, I mean, what percentage of um, students who are struggling to have food are we comfortable with? If it's anything above zero, it's kind of a <laughs> big problem. So um, basic needs refer to housing and food, and um, the rates of basic needs insecurity are higher for marginalized students, including African Americans, students identifying as LGBTQ, and students who are independent from their parents or guardians for financial purposes. Um, <clears throat> students who have served in the military, former foster youth, and students who were formerly convicted of a crime are all at greater risk of basic needs insecurity. Okay, so that was a lot, of, um, a lot of data, a lot of numbers, um, some of them very shocking. Um, but it's important to recognize that uh, there are limitations to the data that we're looking at, to the numbers. Um, and the, from this article by Jess Mitchell, which is called Inclusive, What Is It? Uh, I just want to read this quote briefly. If you're a member of a marginalized community, a minority, you will never be represented in big data if we focus on the majority. So if we're always looking at these big numbers and focusing on um, meeting the needs of the majority of our students, there's a group of students that are always going to end up being neglected and um, and often these are our most vulnerable learners. So then, what are some other or sources of information? Um, what other resources do we have for learning about these students and hearing their stories? Um, so we want to emphasize also that um, there are sources of qualitative data and that it's important to really kind of put a face to, um, to the students that are maybe struggling in our courses. And so some of these sources might include the students themselves. We mentioned earlier um, the importance of getting feedback from students and surveying them. So uh, it's important that we seek out their stories and hear what they have to say. Um, we can also talk to our success advisors. You know, as instructional designers, we work with faculty, and so we don't have a lot of one-on-one -on -one contact with students. Um, so it's important for us in our role to really uh, spend some time hearing those stories and talking to the um, support staff that actually work with students. Uh, financial aid representatives are another important resource, along with our colleagues, um, our faculty, staff, and um, other people that we work with. Um, and as I mentioned, seeking out different voices and soliciting feedback is an inclusive practice. Okay. 
Okay, so <clears throat> we'd like to shift now to another kind of think pair share. So, what sources of data, quantitative or qualitative, um, do you access to learn about your students, um, institutional, national? Do you, you know, listen to stories from your colleagues about their students or um, students that they are interacting with? So go ahead and just take a moment and see where um, you are getting your information about students with stories. Okay, everyone, so let's come back together here. You've had a chance to kind of touch base about um, how you learn about students. So, you know, now that we have, you know, we collect stories about students and data that we can find about students, but how do we make that student data meaningful? And by meaningful, I mean, how do we translate that into design decisions or um, decisions about facilitating a course? <clears throat> So I'd like to give some concrete examples of design decisions that are examples of inclusive design. So um, the first one is adaptive learning, and I know at least one audience member, Susan Fine, is familiar with that. Is anyone else familiar with adaptive learning or Alex? Uh huh. Yeah. Great. Okay. So um, I'll just give a quick description of it. So um, adaptive learning is where um, it's an added piece of technology where the students are surveyed about, let's say, math, for example. The survey shows their weak areas in math, so um, at that point, the software, maybe Alex, for example, can give them practice and quizzes targeting exactly where they're weak in their math areas, so it's great for students who may have had a long break between maybe their high school math class and now they're taking, you know, Math 111 and they're trying to get a college degree after many years of a break. <clears throat> so at OSU, um, mathematics instructor Sarah Clark um, improved student success in developmental math by replacing um, the traditional classroom model with an adaptive, an online adaptive learning program. And that was part of an award from the Online Learning Consortium funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She re redeveloped the course and added adaptive learning, and um, it showed really pretty dramatic results. So um, the failure and withdrawal rates had been about 40 to 45 percent in that math course, the developmental math. They dropped to 14 percent after that, so that was in 2015. And then um, there have also been other studies and situations in, from other institutions as well that show similar dramatic results. Um, so. The other example of an, of an inclusive design decision is adding a basic needs statement 
and that could go in the syllabus, and that's something that we have um, used at eCampus as well. So that basic needs statement just gives um, a quick maybe paragraph about some resources that students could go to if they're having trouble getting um, housing or food. Um, and then there's an option, since we're instructional designers, we can check with the instructor to see if they're comfortable inviting the student to reach out to them if they want you know, additional um, resources or they just want to tell their instructor what they're going through. So <clears throat> that um, enhances things for everyone in the course because it shows that the instructor cares. So even if the student is not struggling in that particular area, I think that it conveys care and concern for the students. Um, so another way to be inclusive for linguistic diversity is to invite students to introduce themselves in any language. So that could be nice if you have VoiceThread, for example, or um, you know, just invite them to use their preferred language to introduce themselves and you know, maybe they'll also say something in English, but I think that that shows the um, diversity of their linguistic strength too and recognizes um, the linguistic diversity in your courses. Um, you can invite students to share preferred pronouns or share their pronouns that they use. <clears throat> Um, include guidelines for discussions so that students who feel maybe a little afraid about being targeted for some reason um, are uh, just more secure with knowing that the instructor has provided guidelines about academic tone, for example. Um, another inclusive practice is to state explicitly that your, that your course has been designed to be inclusive. So um, that's another way that has been shown to um, increase student uh, engagement in the course from people from marginalized backgrounds. Um, you could also encourage a bias hunt if you are feeling like you want to address bias in your course. So a bias hunt could be about the course textbook, for example. So um, sometimes it's hard to select a textbook that you're really comfortable with and maybe there are images that show one particular dominant culture group, for example. Um, but you can invite your students to, you know, gain an extra credit point or two if they are able to point out bias in the textbook or other materials. <clears throat> well, just, um, for example, if you're in a field that um, maybe the textbook shows a lot of people from a dominant culture, perhaps, and it's not really representing images for, from, with people from other cultures or other kinds of backgrounds. Sure, it could be that, or it could be other kinds of. Mm -hmm. It could be other kinds of things too, but just opening that um, feedback up from students and and inviting that so that they don't feel, you know, if they if they're feeling like they want to comment but they are afraid that maybe they'll be penalized or something, or the instructor won't, you know, be very friendly with them anymore for having a negative feedback. Kind of invites them to share their feedback and their personal perspective. <clears throat> um, and so <clears throat> we also um, suggest inviting students to share barriers that they face. So Michelle Pekansky Brock has done some um, great stuff on humanizing online learning. And so she, uh, she suggested doing a short two question survey, maybe in week two of your course, where students um, can just tell you maybe what barriers they face. You can ask them, you know, what barriers do you see? happening in your um, life while you're taking this course. So a student might reveal that they're expecting a baby in week nine or something like that. So it just kind of invites that conversation so that you're aware of some of the things going on in their lives and they're feeling comfortable in letting you know um, something they might be dealing with too. So you can plan around it and they can plan around it. <clears throat> and then another one um, is the use of open educational resources. So that could be particularly helpful for students who are struggling financially, for example. Okay, so um, for making this data meaningful and keeping these, all of these diverse students in mind, um, one way to do that is with personas. And so personas are a fictional representation of a user group, and they're intended to foster empathy and so um, Heather and I have created some personas here. And so I just will pass these out with some, a little packet of activities in a minute, but I just wanted to kind of show you really briefly. 
So these are um, fictional. They're not. They're photos of people, but they're from um, Unsplash, so free to use photos. And then we've used the data that we talked about here from um, national sources, and then also um, stories that we've, um, you know, talked to our success coaches about from our own institution. So we've kind of collected um, these quantitative and qualitative points for these students and created personas. So <clears throat> um, one thing you might notice about these personas is that um, we chose barriers in particular to, in order to design for extremes here. So a lot of these students may have um, disabilities, for example, or they might be having some other barriers that may be financial barriers that they are facing. So um, we will explain our um, a little bit more about personas here and a little bit about the background. Yeah, so we wanted okay. to share some background yeah. on personas and also talk <clears throat> about a little bit about our experience using personas and how we came to, um, to start using them in our design process. Uh, so personas, uh, they've been around since about the 80s. Um, they were initially used in software development um, in the 80s and then in the 90s in product development and marketing. Um, and they've also been used in uh, web user interface design for a while now. But they're fairly new to higher education. Uh, and so when we started kind of exploring this idea, we didn't have a whole lot of models. Uh, we began by taking, uh, just this year, a, an OLC course on personas. Elizabeth took it in the spring mm -hmm. and I took it in the summer. And so one of the first resources we were exposed to in this course was a description of personas from usability.gov. And this description, um, we have it quoted on the slide here, says, the goal of personas is not to represent all audiences or address all needs of the website, but instead to focus on the major needs of the most important user groups. And both of us had a reaction to this. <laughs> um, <laughs> And one of my first questions was, well then, who are our most important user groups? Yeah. Um, we work in a public institution and we serve all students, so how would we even, um, this isn't really, really relevant to us. Um, mm -hmm. Our goal with Personas is to really uh, represent the needs of all users and to work to meet those needs. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right, so let's do an activity using personas. So what I would like us to do is um, we're going to pass out some personas and give you a little course title or course description just to give you a starting point. And um, I'd like you to read through these personas, kind of get to know these students and some of the things um, about them. And then in your group of two or three, We'd like you to think about these questions. <clears throat> so what design decisions would you make to support all three of these personas as they work to meet the learning outcome that we give you? Okay. Um, what barriers do you anticipate these personas will face? And in what ways generally would you support these personas? So you could think back to some of the examples that we gave, but I'm sure you also have examples of your own. So we had you know, the adaptive learning, basic needs statement, those kinds of decisions, but we would also love for you to bring your own experience to these. Okay, so um, as we form groups of two and three, Heather and I will pass out these little packets. So the paper here has the course description and outcome. And if you have your own you want to try, that's great, but this is a starting point that you can use. And then three personas um, for you to design for, okay?
by the name and use policy. Oh, so that's something, that's a feature through Canvas. So that's where the student, instead of the, the name that they have on their um, social security card, for example, if they want to use the name that they prefer, maybe they've changed okay. their name, okay. they can put that into it Canvas. It can be a nickname or some, some other Right, right, gotcha. right, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. That was one I didn't, I didn't know about until then. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll spend about three more minutes on these before we do a little wrap up. outside, like extra, you know, kids or uh -huh. um, single or all kinds of different issues. None of them are married, um, but they all live 100, 
100 miles from the house, and 150 miles away. So obviously, they're online learners. And the more we thought about it, and we thought that closed caption would be good because sometimes as you're seeing the video, you can read it because the distractions, you know. And video conference hours would be good because we want that interaction. And um, oh, no on-campus requirements. Video group work, maybe. Um, since they're a little older, the example is like real world people, mm -hmm. rather than you know, more like themselves. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Jane, do you want anybody else want to share one, one thing that came up in your discussion? Flexibility mm -hmm. and um, the asynchronous mm -hmm. because of the work schedules. But with the flexibility, just in, from my own experience, yeah. there needs to be flexibility, but not so much because that can be stressful as well if it's so open. So mm -hmm. that you mentioned how the work structure is. Mm -hmm. And I know that for my students and perhaps in PTSD, it's just helping um, to break out even assignments, break them to step one, and just breaking it into pieces mm -hmm. and then trying to make, okay, if they need the flexibility, but okay, let's focus on, focus on this. Mm -hmm. And so they feel that sense of, um, they have a security, mm -hmm. okay, I can accomplish this step. Okay. So that was, that's a great one. Yeah. And it will interact with the language, so you can't just, it can't disappear. There has to be at least <laughs> twice a week, yeah. Yeah, some kind of, even if it's asynchronous, there has to be in our instructor students or PT students mm -hmm. actually during the week. <clears throat> they know it's coming. They have, I go, this is the last day. So I oftentimes say prioritize that. And then some of the other assignments that have more flexibility, they can, you know, I encourage them to focus on getting mm -hmm. their discussion posts, initial posts, and by this date. Because, yeah, that can happen. And it doesn't help them either. Right. I think that structure, too, allows them to plan for it. Knowing mm -hmm. ahead of time. Okay. Structure and flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah.
Um, thank you, everyone, for sharing your ideas. This is wonderful. And we only have about a minute left, so we would love to take any questions that you have this last minute. Or um, if you'd like to email any questions to us, we'd be happy to answer them. Yes. Yeah, so that was Learner Experience Design 1 from or, um, Online Learning Consortium, OLC. Yeah, so that was a workshop. I think it was two weeks long. Yeah. Mm -hmm.